Podemos começar, então? Então, uma boa tarde a todos. É, o meu nome é Paula Navarro, eu sou membro da diretoria da Sociedade Brasileira de Reprodução Humana, professora associada do Departamento de Ginecologia Obstetrícia da Faculdade de Medicina de Perão Preto USP e diretora do Laboratório de Reprodução Assistida do HT. E, em nome da Sociedade Brasileira de Reprodução Humana, nós gostaríamos de agradecer a presença de todos vocês ao nosso terceiro webinar. Agora, nos tempos da pandemia, pelo Covid-19, nós médicos temos a utilizado uma parte do nosso tempo para nos atualizar. Pensando, então, nessa importância da atualização do profissional médico, a Sociedade Brasileira de Reprodução Humana está promovendo alguns webinars e hoje convidou o professor Dominique Desigler para falar sobre um tema muito importante, que é endometriose, TIV ou cirurgia? Tá? Considerando que 30 a 50% das mulheres inférteis apresentam endometriose, é um tema extremamente relevante, tanto para o ginecologista geral, quanto para o especialista em reprodução. O Dr. Dominique Desigler, é, Desigler é um... No, um é renomado é, professor, ele é conhecido internacionalmente, tem muita experiência nessa temática, ele é ginecologista, especialista em reprodução e endocrinologia pela Universidade da Califórnia, mas atualmente ele é professor e consultor na FOC Art Center, em Surrey, France, e a NIU, sorry for the French, é, NIU Langone Medical Center, New York. Ele também é editor de renomadas revistas internacionais, publicou mais de 250 artigos, então é extremamente qualificado. Juntamente com o doutor Dominique, também vai participar é, do nosso webinar hoje, a doutora Inês Caterina, ela é minha colega, membro da diretoria da Sociedade Brasileira de Reprodução Humana, é diretora em Medicina Reprodutiva pela Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, é diretora técnica, tanto do Life Search quanto do Laboratório de Reprodução Humana do Hospital das Clínicas da Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais. Depois da apresentação do doutor Dominique, a doutora Inês vai fazer as suas considerações, algumas perguntas, e também está aberto para vocês mandarem perguntas pelo chat durante a apresentação do doutor Dominique, depois eu faço as perguntas para eles. Então, good evening, professor Dominique. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to us to have you today with us. And thank you very much for sharing your precious time and knowledge with us tonight. And we have already introduced you. Then please feel comfortable to start as soon as you can. And thank you again. Thank you very much, Paola. This is a very nice, very nice introduction, and it's a pleasure for me and an honor to participate in this uh, web conference. Uh, I am in Paris, and we, because of the the virus, we don't have the right to go out of home, but we can talk to Brazil. Okay, this is fantastic. So what I'm going to talk about is the difference between. Uh, surgery or ART in endometriosis, what should you choose? And you will see that it's a really in the end, and I try to convey this message, it's a question of time. How much time do you have uh, for choosing one or the other? With this, and without further saying, I will start the presentation. So. Uh, This is now the presentation. Uh, do you see my slides? Okay, let's try again. 
Yes. Do you see the slides? Yes, you yes. have to put full screen, Dominic. Yeah, please. okay. Okay, do you see the slides? Yes. Okay. So this is the this is the team I'm working with uh, in uh, Hospital Foch in Paris. And there are uh, renowned people like Rene Friedman, who is very well known in Brazil, and Paul uh, Pietea and Dr. Bouchard. We're going to talk about surgery or uh, ART. But first, I these are my disclosures. You can look at them. First, I would like to convey to you the concept that endometriosis is actually uh, affecting fertility through different manners. First of all, it, it affects the pelvic cavity. Uh, and in the pelvic cavity, we have this concept that we published recently uh, about the toxic pelvic cavity concept. The inflammation in the pelvic cavity actually alters the sperm oocyte interaction and ultimately alters the oocyte quality and the embryo quality. Uh, we're going to talk also about the ovaries. The ovaries uh, are affected by cysts, and this will affect response to stimulation for ART. And last but not least, we are also, also going to talk about endometrial receptivity, and I know that Paula has worked on this as well. But let me convey to you this principle as an introduction. When you have natural conception, the oocyte actually is uh, encounters the sperm in the distal end of the tube in the environment of the toxic pelvic cavity, and the uh, embryo is uh, affected by that. And this is probably one of the main reasons that endometriosis alters uh, natural conception. But when we do IVF, we actually bypass uh, this uh, route because the oocyte does not go into the pelvic cavity. It goes directly into the tube or the dish. And from there, we have the sperm and we have the embryo, which is put back in the uterus. So the real concept is that natural conception is altered by endometriosis, but IVF is not. And this is really important because some of the confusion that exists in this field is linked to that. With this being said as an introduction, uh, we're going to talk about the medical treatment. The medical treatment, many medical treatments have been proposed from Danazole agonist, and because the agonist created side effects, then there was an ad back therapy that was proposed uh, in the form of using the pill. And actually, what is surprising is that the ADPAC therapy worked just as well as the agonist alone. So this leads to conceive that it is blocking ovulation that is important, not just blocking estradiol. And to the point that actually now, the pill alone, if it's taken continuously, is as effective as the agonist. But now you realize that all these treatments are contraceptive. In other words, they prevent you from becoming pregnant. The medical treatments is, and all these medical treatments are equally effective on pelvic pain and recurrence after surgery. But, but they are ineffective at treating fertility after surgery and ineffective at enhancing fertility. The time on medical treatment is time during which you cannot conceive. And upon stopping, there is no rebound of fertility as people might have expected. This is not the case. So effective for recurrence, for preventing recurrence after surgery, and medical treatment is ineffective 
uh, for fertility. This is a study, a actually a meta-analysis uh, put together by Paolo Vercellini in Italy that shows that if you add uh, medical treatment after surgery, or if you don't, it doesn't change anything in terms of becoming pregnant. So the uh, medical treatment after surgery should not be used because it is just time lost for conceiving. Now, what about surgery? We talked about medical treatment. What about surgery? Well, the principle, and this is something I would like to really emphasize, the principle is that surgery enhances the chances of natural conception. We will see after that it does not improve IVF and it may actually alter ovarian reserve, but surgery enhances the chances of natural conception. This is a study again by Paolo Vercellini. It's a classical one in which uh, he looked at fecundity after surgery. And you see that after 18 months after surgery, you have an about 50% cumulative pregnancy rates. And all the different curves show different stages of endometriosis and there are no differences, irrespective of whether it is mild or severe, uh, it, it's equally effective. Uh, this is a meta-analysis showing the same thing, that 50% chances of conceiving after surgery, conceiving naturally, and you have to wait one to a, one year to a year and a half. So you see already that you need to have time uh, for offering surgery as a treatment. This is a work by uh, Horace Roman, who is in France, showing that uh, if you have uh, colorectal endometriosis, it does not interfere with uh, the chance of conceiving after surgery. But but it enhances natural conception, but does not uh, improve IVF. And this is pretty important because this is the center of the choice that you make between, that, between uh, uh, IVF and surgery. This is a uh, meta-analysis by the group uh, in uh, Northern countries and you see that surgery does not improve in all these uh, groups, does not improve uh, the chance of conception uh, by IVF. So then uh, if there are no convincing evidence that, it favors surgery, that surgery favors uh, IVF, there is no reason to propose surgery before IVF. Surgery for natural conception, yes. Surgery for IVF, no. This is the essence of the dialogue. The impact of endometriosis on ART outcome. Uh, this is uh, a study that shows that IV, uh, endometriosis per se uh, interferes with the number of all sites retrieved uh, but does not, in essence, modify life birth rate uh, after IVF. So it's, a, as in essence, the disease alters of our response to stimulation. And we will see again that it increases the cancellation rate, but it does not so much effect on IVF outcome for the reason I showed you before in the first slide. Surgery does not improve IVF, but it may alter ovarian reserve. And this is uh, the major concern because it doesn't help, but it may harm. You want to be, you want to be cautious. This is the work that we have done ourselves. Uh, and uh, this is AMH taken before surgery in controls and in people with different stages of endometriosis, superficial endometrioma and deep infiltrating endometriosis. AMH was the same, but the subgroup of people who had been operated before had a lower AMH level. Uh, now, 
This is the same uh, analysis, not with AMH, but with follicular count. And you see that uh, surgery uh, alters, and this is the part that I want you to uh, draw your attention to, uh, surgery alters the number of follicles. This is the, the side that was operated on versus the other side, and you see that you have less follicle on the side that was operated. So, surgery can harm. Therefore, uh, you have to uh, you have to realize that if you do surgery for pain in a young woman who is not trying to become pregnant yet because she's not married, you might actually uh, envision uh, fertility preservation in women uh, who you operate for surgery. Uh, even in this case, you can have a duplex stimulation. Now, I said, and I persist in saying, that uh, surgery does not help IVF. However, there are people who don't share this view. The majority of people uh, agree with what I say. Uh, there are a few individuals, few groups, notably two of them, both of them in France actually, who say that uh, surgery uh, improved, uh, improves IVF. And this is a group by, uh, again, Horace Roman and Emil Deray. And this is their results in which they had two groups, one that had first line ART in, re in red, and the other group that had first line surgery followed by ART in terms of IVF cycles uh, and uh, actually you see that uh, for live birth rate and cumulative pregnancy rate in their hands, they claim that they have better results after surgery. This is, I believe, the exception. Most people don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe that surgery does not help IVF. Now, the times have changed. It used to be that diagnostic laparoscopy was part of routine, uh, routine uh, workup for endometriosis. Uh, routine workup for endometriosis because uh, this was part of diagnosing endometriosis. As now we go for IVF first, in most cases, because IVF has become so uh, uh, effective, uh, there is an issue of diagnosis of endometriosis because if we don't do surgery, then therefore the dogma that the diagnosis is surgical is actually to be discussed. This is a study uh, reported by SR SART, the uh, US registry, that shows that in their group of 39,000 IVF cycles, they had an incidence of 11% endometriosis, which is unbelievable. You realize that the incidence of endometriosis in infertile women, and you agree with me that the majority of people who do IVF are infertile, except for the uh, spouses of male factor, but otherwise are infertile, you should have a much higher incidence of endometriosis. This is because in those uh, charts, they only base a diagnosis based on prior surgery, and we don't do surgery anymore. So therefore, we have to fall back on a different technique. And this is an important message as well. Endometriosis used to be a surgical diagnosis. No more, no more we have now to introduce and accept that endometriosis is also diagnosed by ultrasound and MRI. 
And if you have a uh, mapping system of ultrasound findings, you can actually have extremely good uh, uh, diagnosis of endometriosis. This is the description, the areas that you have to look at, uh, the uh, rectal uh, vaginal area, as you see here, and so on and so forth. So uh, now we have to accept that endometriosis has to be diagnosed by imaging. MRI is even better than, than ultrasound. This is a meta-analysis from the Cochrane review system. And you see that here, transvaginal ultrasound for deep endometriosis. And you see how the rock analysis shows the results uh, <clears throat> far in the corner, indicating a high um, specificity of transvaginal ultrasound. This is for rectosemoid endometriosis. And again, all the data from this meta-analysis are up in the corner indicating high specificity. And this is uh, transvaginal ultrasound, again, in the uh, Cochrane review, rectovaginal uh, and MRI. And you see here you have sensitivity and specificity. And if you look at the small blue dots, you see that they all moved uh, toward 100% one, which uh, is equivalent to 100% sensitivity and specificity. And actually, we now accept that uh, ultrasound and MRI have the value of replacement uh, for the diagnosis of uh, endometriosis. What about the blood markers? Uh, for uh, diagnosing uh, endometriosis non-invasively, such as uh, uh, CA125 and so on. But this is different. In this case, uh, the biomarkers are interesting, but only for uh, research, because there is not enough accuracy for using it uh, clinically. Uh, what about non-coding RNAs? Uh, there again, lots of promises and lots of potential future, but at this stage now, those are uh, interesting markers for research, but not for uh, clinical practice. What about endometriomas and ART? What about the specificity of endometriomas? Well, uh, this is uh, a prospective longitudinal study, uh, the error study, uh, indicating that actually you have a AMH decline uh, for endometriomas uh, over six months uh, of 20% uh, when uh, it's unilateral and 33% when it's bilateral. And they also have an age rate decline when there is no endometrioma. So endometriomas may actually induce a progressive decline in AMH. This is not shared by everyone. Some people don't find that. Now, the endometrioma, what's the impact on IVF? Well, if you see this uh, work, uh, which is uh, a meta-analysis of uh, other relevant studies, you see that the endometrioma is actually mainly impacting on the cancellation rate, uh, not so much on live birth rate. So endometrioma does not, it reduces the number of all sites that you get, it reduces the number of follicles, uh, and that leads to a, an increased cancellation rate. But if you have enough all sites and embryos, it does not impair uh, ART outcome. Now, what about the risk that IVF itself induces a flare of the disease? Uh, and this is something we have ourselves studied at the time I was at Cochin. And with, with uh, this prospective trial, we looked at 
uh, the impact of IVF itself conducted in women with endometriosis versus control. Now, I have to tell you that in endometriosis, we use the antagonist protocol with agonist trigger and uh, deferred embryo transfer. And you see here, uh, these are the symptoms in endometriosis and in controls. You have more symptoms of pain and various different symptoms in endometriosis and controls. The first mark here is when we synchronize the patients and we put them on the pill. So this decrease in symptoms is a beneficial effect of the pill and there is no flare thereafter. So contrary to what was told for COHIUI, in case of uh, IVF, uh, there is no flare of the disease. And the reason we believe for this is that in, CO, in uh, COSIUI, there is ovulation and the release of all the follicle content into the pelvic cavity, which is extremely rich in estradiol, whereas when you do IVF, the liquid is aspirated and not uh, flushed in the, in the pelvic cavity. And this is why ART does not induce a flare of the disease. Now, the precaution, of course, is that don't do IVF if the patient is painful beforehand. And again, in our group, we had studied the fresh transfer versus deferred embryo transfer in case of endometriosis, for reasons that are related to implantation, uh, we'll look at this in a, in a second, uh, the uh, pregnancy rate is higher when you have uh, deferred embryo transfer as compared to fresh transfer. Now, if you don't remove the endometriomas, because we tell you that you know surgery does not, does not help IVF, and you end up doing IVF with endometriomas. This is a practical consequence. And if you do uh, uh, have endometriosis, uh, endometriomas when you do IVF, uh, there is a risk of tubular ovarian abscess. And we did ourselves a study, uh, again, when I was at Cochin, in which we actually looked at the incidence of tubular ovarian abscesses in women who also had endometriosis. And that was over four years. And we found 10 cases, but only three of the 10 cases had IVF. So the concept is that a pelvic abscess in a woman with endometriomas also occurs without IVF. So the uh, risk exists, but it is probably slightly over uh, reported because it also occurs in the absence of IVF. Now, a couple of words on the last topic, uh, endometriosis and implantation. Uh, this is the concept uh, uh, what, that you have in donor oocytes. When you give estradiol and progesterone, you have the effect on the uterus. But in the uh, endometriosis, when you give estradiol and progesterone, the effects are different because of two reasons. There is a local production of estradiol, and there is a resistance um, to the effect of progesterone, uh, possibly uh, as uh, Paola has published uh, by methylation of the progesterone receptor. This is the BCL6 outcome, and as you know, uh, Bruce Leslie in the US has developed a test, a commercial test, Unfortunately, this has been studied only in uh, 20 patients or so. In these cases, when the BCL6 is positive, uh, you have a pregnancy rate that's very poor and a high pregnancy rate when BCL6 is negative. Unfortunately, they put the, uh, the, the test on the market, but they have not done further testing. Uh, this is uh, subacute pelvic uh, and, 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 endometri and, and sorry, endometritis, which uh, in a study that we conducted in a group, with a group in Italy, we showed that there is a high prevalence of chronic endometritis in women with endometriosis. So 
you have to think about it and possibly treat it if you see these micro polyps on the hysteroscopy. Uh, this is the incidence of uh, uh, endometritis uh, by hysteroscopy, histology, and CD138 in women with endometriosis and in controls who are infertile women without endometriosis. So when you have endometriosis, think of uh, chronic endometritis. And now we come to the conclusion of practical management. And this uh, color diagram shows that the green is ART and the red is surgery. Uh, and you see that uh, the uh, ART is really for the people between the age of 30 and 40, which is the majority of people we see. Surgery is for the younger patients. And so this is really the last uh, couple of slides for uh, the managing of uh, infertility with endometriosis and uh, trying to decide whether you're gonna do surgery or ART. And, uh, if you are, if you are at the beginning, uh, look at age, whether you have enough time, because as I said, surgery implies that you wait uh, 12 to 18 months for natural conception. And uh, if you have an ovarian reserve that's sufficient, if you have a tu no tubal factor, and if you have enough sperm, then uh, you can conceive surgery. Uh, but if the patient is 35, you don't have the time to wait two years. You have to go for uh, ART right away. And if you go for ART, the principle is no surgery before ART. This is the same if you have a tubal factor or if you have a sperm problem. There is no need to do surgery for natural conception if there is no sperm. It's not going to work, okay? As with all rules, there are exceptions. And the exceptions are, if you have a hydrosopinx, you have to do surgery uh, because this is going to alter ART outcome. And if you have a very large endometrioma, don't tell me how much is very large. Very large is very large. In essence, very large means when you cannot have access to the um, uh, to the follicle. So I hope I convinced you that uh, surgery or ART is an issue of time. Surgery enhances natural conception. Uh, but you need a year or year and a half to conceive naturally after surgery. In the other circumstances, the majority of people, there are, as I said, a couple of exceptions, but the majority of people, and includes ourselves, believe that you should not do surgery before, uh, before ART. Uh, you should do ART and go directly uh, to pregnancy. If you do ART, we recommend the um, antagonist protocol and the agonist triggering followed by deferred embryo transfer because the agonist triggering avoids the cyst. You don't want to have a cyst with endometriosis. It avoids also hyperstimulation. And also the deferred embryo transfer actually uh, abolishes the uh, resistance to progesterone because the uh, uterus is disconnected from ovarian function and receptivity is restored. And with this, I thank you very much. I try to restore. Uh, so I need to close this. Is that right? Am I, can you see me? Mm, not yet. Can you yeah. see me now? Yes. Hold on a second. Did I do something wrong? Ah, just stop sharing the presentation, please.
Okay. Okay. All right. Was this uh, understandable? Yes, completely. Thank you. It, it was a very nice lecture, complete one. And now we are going to open uh, for questions and for Dr. Okay. Inés uh, to give her opinion about the talk. Thank you. Inés? Uh, thank you, Dr. Dominique. It was wonderful. You, you said almost everything I want to question. So now I have um, just uh, some points to, 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 to emphasize. Um, you said you always do the antagonist protocols with GNR trigger, okay? Yes, endometriosis. Yes, you use uh, OCPU prior and how long? Oh, we used the pill uh, before, before. There was a time where people recommended using the agonist for six months. And then we have also published an article using the pill for six to nine weeks before. But now we don't do this anymore. Now we have vitrification. We use the pill for one or two or three weeks, that's all, just to synchronize the, the cycle. And then we do the antagonist protocol we use FSH and HMG, and then we trigger ovulation and we transfer a month later. If there is adenomyosis, I did not talk about that. We use uh, one month agonist in between the retrieval and the transfer. Oh, just if there is adenomyosis. It, it was yeah. my next question. To, to do the frozen transfer, you use analog or just uh, a natural cycle, which protocol do you use? If it's only endometriosis, we use estradiol and progesterone. We use estradiol uh, orally or transdermally, it depends, usually orally. We use uh, four milligram in the morning, four milligram in the evening. And then after two or three weeks, we measure the endometrial thickness. It has to be more than seven millimeters. And then we start the, uh, the progesterone and we transfer blastocyst. We only freeze blastocyst. We transfer blastocyst on the sixth day of progesterone. Okay, perfect. É, Paula, tem alguma pergunta aí da, do chat para a gente tentar responder? Se não, eu tenho mais perguntas, mas vamos priorizar o chat, ah. né? Ah, o Fábio, o gênio, é, a colega, Ask you, Dr. Dominique, if in any circumstance do you uh, block pituitary with an analog of GnRH for three months before performing the cycle or the frozen embryo transfer? No, not anymore. Not anymore. Only oral contraceptive pills, as you said. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Paula. Questions. Okay. Paula, vou fazer uma pergunta. Posso? Sure. É... Dominique, please, if uh, uh, for some reason the center prefer to do a fresh embryo transfer, you would recommend uh, the long protocol with GNRH? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Dominique, for patients with uh, recurrent implantation failure uh, mm -hmm. that were not submitted previous to IVF to surgery. In this case, uh, do you recommend surgery or do you, do you have another protocol to recommend? Well, if you, have, if you have people who have failed like three IVF, in this case, you come, uh, you come to the point where you might actually do the surgery before ART. This is one of the exceptions. Then you uh, use three IVFs, failure to three IVFs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Paula, deixa eu só esclarecer uns pontos aqui, porque tem algumas perguntas nesse, no chat sobre isso. É, só para a gente né, sincronizar aqui, 
Então, ele usa protocolo antagonista em todas as pacientes, com três semanas de pílula antes, alguém perguntou quanto tempo, ele não usa mais três, quatro meses, igual antigamente, então ele faz três semanas de anticoncepcional, protocolo antagonista, trigger com análogo, congela todos os embriões, e aí ele faz uma transferência no ciclo natural com estrogênio e progesterona apenas. Se a paciente tiver adenomiose associada à endometriose, aí sim ele faz o análogo do GNRH para fazer a transferência de embrião congelado. Né? Então, são, são situações diferentes. E no caso que eu perguntei de ciclos, né, centros que preferem ainda transferir a fresco, aí nesses casos ele indicaria mais o protocolo longo. Como ele faz o frisol de todas as pacientes com endometriose, ele usa o protocolo antagonista e o trigger do GNRH, provavelmente por causa da segurança, né? Tá exactly, que... exactly. Oh, okay. you understand, doctor. Uh, doctor Dominique, and if the patient is using Dianogest uh, and she wants to perform IVF, Uh, do you stop how many days before the beginning of the cycle, or do you change to oral contraceptive pill? And we, change, we change to oral contraceptive pill. And if she cannot use your oral contraceptive pill... Okay, for, right. Yeah. Okay, this, this, is, this is important because one or two percent of, of women uh, across the world should not use oral contraceptive because of risk of thromboembolism. And then you can synchronize. We synchronize in these people with the transdermal estradiol. And how do you use? Can you tell to the? Uh, we use the skin patches. You know the uh, Vivel dot or uh, Estra dot, okay. and we use that for one or two weeks, which uh, from day one of the of the menses, or if she's on the energest on the day that you stop until uh, the day before starting gonadotropins. Now, okay. Uh, 50 microgram per day? We use two, two patches, 100 microgram. Every day or each no, two? It, no, they change twice a week. Twice, okay. okay. Doc, uh, Dr. Dominique, I, I have a, if you, I want to know if you have any experience In those women using levonorgestrel releasing device, okay, yeah. who, who wants to do uh, the IVF or just to preserve her own sites, you have an experience using this progesterone, this kind of progesterone to blockage LA surge, or you always remove the device? No, this is a good question, actually, very good. Uh, when we were doing uh, donor egg, uh, we had donors who had an IUI uh, with a levonorgestrel releasing IUI, and we actually compared the results with women who did not have the IUI, and there's no difference. So if you do fertility preservation and you want to save the oocytes, there's no need to remove the, I the IUD. But you use something to block LH surge, or you use this progesterone to do the, instead of the antagonist? Well, uh, this is a good question. Again, we, we uh, actually did use the antagonist, but probably it's not necessary. Okay, you don't have experience without the antagonist. No, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. And But for you know, the, Chinese, the Chinese are using the, the progesterone instead of the antagonist. Yes. And for egg freezing, uh, independently of endometriosis, are you using Dianogest to block the LH surge? No. The progesterone? No. Yeah. No? For, for the, no, for the uh, to transfer? No, uh, for egg freezing, uh, instead of using antagonist, are you using a uh, dihydrogesterone? No, block we have. We, we, we actually uh, should consider that, but we have not implemented that yet. 
but it, it's clearly from the, all the studies in China uh, shows that you can actually do that. Now, thank you. Let me see if there are more questions. If you have more, I miss. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Dominique, if uh, in your practice, if you have a uh, 30 years old women with endometriosis and want to to, to preg to, to begin pregnant, you indicate surgery or IVF. But it depends how old is she. 30. 30. If yeah. she she has if she has uh, then the question also is whether the endo she has endometriomas, whether it's on one side or both sides. If she has, for example, only on one side, even if she has several, and uh, if the sperm of the husband is good, yeah, and the tubes the tubes are patent, yes. uh, and she agrees to wait, okay, okay, for 18 months, then you do surgery. You prefer surgery. Yeah, but she has. It's a discussion with the patient. Okay. Uh, the the patient can tell. No, I don't want to wait in a year and a half because I've been waiting too long. But if but you, I propose surgery uh, and tell her that she has a 50% chance of conceiving within a year and a half. And you would indicate uh, all site preservation first for these women? Well, a woman who has surgery because of pain, yeah, you need to propose uh, all site preservation because okay. the surgery can actually alter ovarian reserve. Yes, but she, if she wants to get pregnant and you indicate surgery because she's young, you will do a site preservation or no? No, 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 no. Okay. And Dr. Dominique, considering the high cost of IVF and low access, for in Brazil, there is no yeah. public uh, IVF support. And for uh, women with mild disease, with uh, no tubal uh, problem, good semen quality, uh, do you uh, recommend IUE before IVF? No. No, I don't recommend IUI. I mean, if uh, if this person uh, has issues with uh, the cost of IVF, maybe I will recommend surgery. Uh, the problem is like surgery is very good if you have good surgeons and good equipment. Yeah. And Are you a good surgeon? <laughs> no, I do not perform surgery for more than 15 years now. Only IVF, but Only that's IVF. a problem because, like, uh, for mild endometriosis, it's okay; it's not a, a big deal. But for mm -hmm. DP infiltrating endometriosis in bowel, then you need a good surgery, good uh, team, and yeah. we have limited ones here. Now I don't do it myself either, but we have uh, Doctor Ayub from our group uh, does it. Okay. Yeah, you need to have a good surgeon. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, then... Uh, uh, one okay. question. Uh, if you have a patient very symptomatic with pain and she is not old, she's around 32, 33 years, but she's symptomatic, uh, in this case, do you uh, indicate surgery or do you to block the, the ovary function and do IVF? Well, she, she wants to have a baby as well. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, you ask the patient, what is more important, having a baby or the pain? Uh, some people will say, well, I want to have the baby, forget the pain, so you do IVF. But if the pain is unmanageable, uh, sometimes uh, it's really uh, unbelievable how much pain they can have. Uh, then you do the surgery. Okay. Uh, no more questions for the chat. Okay. Then, Dr. Dominique, uh, once again, thank okay. you very much for sharing your time. And it your was a knowledge. pleasure. 
and hope to see you personally after this terrible time. Yes, okay. Bye-bye. I enjoy bye -bye. it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.